Hi everybody, my name is Marcus Helberg, and today I want to talk about choosing a front-end framework for your Java backend. Now, I got started programming a long, long time ago, doing silly HTML and CSS stuff in my browser. That then quickly turned into a bunch of JavaScript hacking, and by the time I was in my first real job, I was pretty much neck deep in enterprise Java. So, more or less my entire career has been spent in this interface between Java and the web. So with all this experience, I hope to be able to give you a little bit of an insight into what it takes to choose the right framework for the right project. Now, I work as the head of the open source community at a company called Vaadin. We have two web frameworks that are specifically created for Java backends. So of course, I'm a little bit partial to these, but in this talk, I really try to stay as objective and unopinionated as possible to help you choose the right framework for your specific project and needs. All right, so let's say that you have a really good idea for a new web app. You go to Google, you type in how to build a web app, and you get bombarded with tens, hundreds of different libraries, tools, frameworks, platforms, all kinds of different things that claim to be the best way of building a web app. And this can be pretty overwhelming. How do you know which one to choose? You don't want to paint yourself into a corner uh, having to regret your decision a little bit down the road, having to redo part of the application, for instance, or just noticing that this is not going to work out for what you have in mind. So we need to figure out a framework for dealing with frameworks, so to speak. So before we get there, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about the difference between libraries and frameworks, because I think this is an important aspect into understanding what makes sense for your specific need. Here, I'm going to use React as an example. I'm using React just because it's very well known. So the same would apply for lit element or any other small library like React. So say you chose React as the base for your new application. Now React is a library. It's not a framework, meaning that React doesn't try to be everything that you need when building a web application. It tries to only do a single thing and do that really well. So React is essentially a small helper that helps you build components with reactive templates. So they have a state and they reactively update the DOM very efficiently when that state changes. Now that's a really good foundation, but when you start building a larger application, you're going to most likely need a couple of other things. So, so for instance, you might need a way of moving between views. So some sort of routing probably need to figure out how to deal with state across different views on like an application scale. For that, of course, you could use the built in hooks and properties past the state between different components in the tree. Or you could go with a state management library like Redux or MobX. If you go with those, you need to choose uh, if you're going to use something like Redux Toolkit or MST, or if you're just going to go plain vanilla with those. Uh, if you have a lot of forms in your application, using state and uh, hooks might not be a very convenient option for you. So you might want to look into some form libraries that are out there to make that job easier for you. Then the look and feel of the application. So what do you do with components and CSS? Do you build your own components and style them? Do you use a CSS library, say Tailwind or something like that? Or do you use a component library like Material or Ant, something like that? So you, again, do a couple of choices, decide what you need for your application. And of course, a application these days almost always needs some sort of backend. So you need some place where you can persist data. You might need to run some sort of server side logic uh, on the server. So you need to figure out what do you use on the server. Now, if you're on Java, like I assume we are here, you might use something like Spring Boot. If you're a node, you might use something like Express. In Microsoft land, you might be using ASP.NET or similar. Of course, that opens up a whole new box of questions like what do we use for database, authorization, authentication, all of that stuff. Once we've sorted out our backend, we need to figure out how do we connect to it? Do we use REST? Do we use WebSockets? Maybe GraphQL, something else? So again, quite a lot of questions that we need to answer before we can actually get to building that application. We also need to figure out what are the tools we use for building the application, like Webpack maybe, ES Build on the front end, maybe Maven on the back end. What do we use for the language in the front end? Maybe we use just plain JavaScript, maybe we use TypeScript. How do we structure the project? What's a good way of uh, making sure that as the project grows bigger, it stays maintainable? 
So a lot of questions and this continues going on to testing internationalization and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, we make our decisions, we have a set of tools and libraries here. So essentially, what we've done here is we've designed our own framework specifically for this project. This is good. Now, now we're ready to actually start uh, coding our app. Now, the problem I often see with this approach is that six months later, something gets updated, say React gets an update, and all of a sudden you're in a situation where one of these third party dependencies that you've uh, used for building up your framework doesn't support that update. So now you're stuck between, do I stay on an older version of React and not use some of the new features there? Or do I up, uh, update that and figure out the new set of UI components that I can use, for instance? Now, this is a very contrived example with these specific libraries, but uh, in a real project, your dependencies often have dependencies and so on. So uh, by putting together your own framework, you actually end up depending on a whole lot of other people and open source projects to kind of keep their stuff together and make sure that they keep updating their stuff at the same, uh, same pace. So the way I like to think about this is that pretty much every project uses a framework. It's either one that you've more or less implicitly put together yourself when you decided all the tools and libraries that you use, or then you picked a ready framework off the shelf, uh, like say Angular or Vaughn Fusion. So essentially that determines who is responsible for keeping that set of tools and libraries in sync. Is it you or is it somebody else? All right, so now with that out of the way, let's take a look at the libraries and frameworks that we're gonna work with today. We're gonna take a look at React, of course, the, the big dog out there. And we're gonna take a look at Lit Element, which is a similar sized uh, library by Google. We're also gonna take a look at Vue and Angular, which are very popular choices. And finally, we're going to take a look at Wadenflow and Wadden Fusion, which are our frameworks that are specifically designed for Java backends. Now let's start looking at these in the big picture context. So let's put them on a continuum from you having more choice as a developer and choosing the tools and libraries that you use to more productivity. So less choice, but you have more kind of decisions made for you so you can get uh, jump into actual coding uh, faster. So libraries like React and Lit Element come with a very minimal set of functionality. Essentially, you get a very flexible component API, but that's also pretty much all that you get with those. Now, if we move one step forward towards more productivity, a couple of those choices have been now made for you. So you get a framework that kind of contains most of the things that you need for building applications. So you'll start getting uh, not only things for creating a single component, but for also for putting components together into an application. So you'll have things like routing, state management, uh, maybe form libraries and so on with Vue. Now, if we take one step further, we come to a more fully featured framework like Angular. Now, Angular markets itself as a platform. The distinction between library framework and platform is somewhat elusive. It, it's not a very clear cut separation, but essentially when you go from having a framework to a platform, usually that means that you also get some components, you get some tooling to kind of help put together. So again, uh, Angular has made even more choices for you and comes with even more of the tools and, and, and libraries that you need for building an app. So essentially more or less a one-stop shop for everything you need on the front end. And finally, at the other end of the spectrum, we have full stack frameworks like VOD and Flow and Fusion, where not only do you get a uh, fully featured front end framework, but you also get a back end framework, server client communication, tooling uh, components, pretty much everything that you need to build an application. So that means you spend close to zero time setting up anything, configuring anything, you just get started coding right away. Now, what about JHipster? If you're a Java developer and you looked into front-end uh, development at all, you probably run into this before. Now, jhipster is a project generator. So essentially, it's a guided walk through all those steps that we took a look at earlier. So it will walk you through selecting a back-end, front-end, configuring all of those, and kind of deciding which libraries and configurations you want to have in your specific project. And it will then generate those into your project. So essentially, it automates the the decision process and generates all the kind of needed boilerplate and setup code so that you don't need to do that. 
but it's not a full stack framework in the sense that it only generates those into your project folder, meaning that you're still the one who needs to maintain those going forward. All right, so let's dig a little bit deeper into all of these uh, libraries and frameworks. I'm going to use the same to do application as an example for each, just so we have a kind of clear reference point to see what the differences similarities are. Now, all of them are pretty similar in the sense that you have a component based uh, model for defining the UI. And most of them have a reactive uh, programming model where you have a state that then gets reflected into a template. Now react like you remember is a component uh, library, meaning that it helps us build stateful components that have reactive templates. What that means in practice is that we have up here a way of defining a state. In this case, we have two pieces of state, we have a list of to do's and the current test that we're setting. Anytime these change, this uh, template down here will get rendered. Here we have an input that's bound to the task state and updates that and then a button that's hooked up to this function add to do which essentially just mutates the to do state by adding a new to do item. And then finally, we map over that array, essentially creating a sub template for each item there. So in this case, we have an unordered list, and we create a list item for each of those. And that's all it takes to build a small to do application in react and we get something that looks like this. Lit element is a library by Google, which is very similar in scope. So it's also just a library for building components that are reactive. Its main difference is that it's based on browser standards. So it's a little bit lighter weight. It's a little bit faster in terms of performance. Again, we have a way of defining properties uh, and properties being the state. Whenever those change, our template uh, gets updated. Again, we have an input that's bound to the task, and we have a button that calls add to do. Exactly the same as in the React example, we mutate the to do state. So we create a new array with a new to do and clear out the task, which will then update the template again. And very similar to React here, we map over all the to do's, providing a sub template for uh, each list item. Okay. So then let's jump into view. View is a framework. So it has a couple more features that we didn't have in react or lit element. So it gives us not only a reactive component model, but it also gives us things like form helpers, a way of routing between components, managing app state. So a view component is essentially a file that contains two or three sections. So at least you need a template, which is what gets rendered when the state changes. You need a script uh, where you export the component definition. The data contains the state. So again, we have the to do array and a task for uh, the current task. And then we define methods here, uh, in this case, an add to do method. The logic is exactly the same, uh, with the difference here being that we are using this custom V model for binding this input to the task. So we're not listening for that. Uh, we're not listening for that change event and updating it ourselves, but that's something that the framework takes care for us. Otherwise, this is pretty much exactly the same. So we have a unordered list, and then we create a list item for uh, each uh, to do in in the to do's array. Again, you can see that there's a slightly different syntax here, whereas react and lit element use essentially just JavaScript for the templating. Here we have a custom template syntax. So a little bit more kind of framework specific things we need to learn, but on a conceptual level, very similar again. Okay, and then if we take a look at Angular, as you remember, it's again, one step further towards more choices having been made for you it comes with a component model, uh, it comes with routing forms, dependency injection, testing tools, internationalization, UI components that follow the material design standard. And this is all using TypeScript. Now, a Angular component is typically defined in at least two files. So you have a TypeScript file where you have the component definition in TypeScript, and then you usually uh, refer to a template uh, through a URL to a different file. I have it down here. 
So again, the idea is that whenever the state changes, in this case, our, our to do's uh, or the form, this template gets changed. Now, if we take a look at the template here, you'll notice that it looks quite a bit different from everything we've had so far. So we're using the Angular uh, form group feature here in order to turn this form into a Angular form. That's allowed us to do things like define validators on, on, on the content. So we don't need to validate things ourselves. We just define that the task should start out empty, but it's required for submitting the form. And then Angular will make sure that that gets enforced. You can see that the syntax is also different. So we're not using plain uh, JavaScript for interpolation, but we're using specific uh, Angular syntax for, for defining the template. We're also using uh, the Angular material uh, design UI component. So we have a material form field that wraps the input here to give us this material input. And we're using a material button here for a material design button. And then finally, we loop through all the to do's again, showing the task here, we're using the ng4 syntax. So again, a Angular specific uh, syntax for that. All right, now let's take a look at button fusion. Now, Fusion is the first full stack framework that we're looking at. So this is the first framework where Java comes into play. Any of the earlier examples didn't really care what their backend is. Essentially, you would use REST or GraphQL or WebSockets or gRPC or whatever you, you happen to use to communicate with the backend. The libraries and frameworks don't really care where that data is coming from. Whereas with Fusion, we have made one more choice for you. We've decided that uh, if you use a Spring Boot backend, we can automate a whole bunch of things for you. So we're using lit element on the front end. We're using Spring Boot on the back end. We give you things like routing and forms to kind of give you a, a fully featured front end framework. We take care of automatically generating TypeScript types based on your Java types on the back end. And we give you a type safe way of accessing the back end from your TypeScript code. Uh, we also give you a big library of ready-made UI components that make up a customizable design system. So you can customize the look and feel of those. Now let's take a look in code what this actually means. So here I've defined a to-do as a Java object as opposed to a TypeScript interface in the previous Angular example. So I have a task again. Uh, I've defined a validation as a bean validation here uh, in Java. The way I access the backend is through an endpoint. You can define an endpoint by taking a Java class and annotating it with endpoint. By default, all endpoints are secured. So you need to either uh, specifically annotate them as anonymous allowed, or then you need to make sure that you have a way of logging in people before trying to use it. Here, I auto wire in a Spring Data repository because I'm uh, using Spring Boot. And then I expose two methods, get to do's, which will find all the to do's in our repo and the save to do, which will call the database repository to save that to do. You can see I'm using uh, the Java objects here. And what's cool about fusion is that it will generate those same types for us to be used in TypeScript. So here you can see we've been able to type this array of to do's with a to do type, which was automatically generated for us. And when we create this component, we're able to call this to-do service endpoint that we created to get all the to-dos with a simple uh, asynchronous uh, method call. So you can see we have full type safety going all the way from the back end to the front end. We have full autocomplete. If something changes in the back end type, that's going to get reflected in the front end, and that's going to mean that your compilation will fail if you change something in the back end, that's going to break the front end, which is super helpful when you're building a lot larger project. We're also using the Vaadin binder uh, for taking care of the form. For that, we're using a to do model, which is also generated by Vaadin, which is essentially all the information we need to know about this to do in order to bind to it. So not only what are the properties, but also what are the validations needed for those properties. So when we use the field uh, binder helper here, using the spread syntax to bind to the task on the model. Essentially, Vaadin will take care of listening to the changes on the input. It will take care of validating, showing validation errors, all of that for us.
And then finally, we can tell the binder uh, when we save that it should submit to the save to do method on our backend. Again, so we have full type safety all the way through, and that's going to make things kind of very easy as you're developing because you have autocomplete uh, throughout the entire application. But perhaps even more important, six months down the road, when you're changing your backend code and you change something in that API, you're going to get compilation errors in your front end code immediately if you break something. So that's going to give you a little bit more security as you're going in your project and kind of more confidence that you're not breaking stuff. Like I mentioned, we have a design system with 40 plus components that are customizable. So you can define the kind of look and feel of them to match what you want in your application or your brand. And that's something that, again, helps you save a bunch of time up front because you don't need to de design all of these things or use a lot of time on CSS. Now, finally, let's talk about Vaughn Flow. This is an entirely different way of building a web application from all the previous ones that we've si seen. So we still have a component model, but instead of using HTML for defining templates, we're building the UI programmatically in Java. This runs on the JVM, and Vaughn takes care of all the communication between the browser and the server for you. So essentially, you don't touch more or less any of the web technologies. You're building an app as if it was a desktop application. It just happens to run in a browser. It uses that same set of UI components and design system and has all the same features, basically, of routing forms as Vaughn Fusion does. So if you look at the application, you can see we have an a uh, class here extending from a Vaadin vertical layout mapped to an empty route. So that means that it's mapped to the root of the context. Instead of using HTML to define components, we're defining them as Java components. So we have text fields, buttons, unordered lists. And we have a similar binder concept here uh, to bind to this to do Java object that we looked at earlier. So we define the UI here in the constructor by creating first the form, which is a horizontal layout containing the input field and the button. And then we have a, the task list underneath that, which is the unordered list. We use the binders bind instance field, which will reflectively look at the to-do and uh, this to-do application and match fields by their names. So our model object had a task field, and we have a task field here, and it will map those automatically to each other. So we don't have to specifically uh, configure that this input field should match that on the model object. Instead, they're going to, by default, use a convention-based mapping. We also hook up the button click listener to add task here, which will then uh, use that binder to write the bean and save that to the database and update the tasks. Update tasks essentially just clears out any previous list items and then loops through all the to-dos and adds a new list item component for each one of them. So the end result looks exactly the same, but the way we got there is entirely different. So this is a good option if you are purely a Java developer, you enjoy building uh, UIs in Java and having everything in one language. This is a really good op uh, option for that. All right, so now that we've taken a look at all these different options, what should you choose? I would say that a library like React or Lit Element is a good choice if you really value that choice and you want to customize every part of your stack. It's also a good choice if you're building a really small app or an app that has a shorter lifespan where you don't really care that much if things change later on, or a small app where you don't necessarily need everything that a framework would offer. You just need a component model and that's it. A more fully featured framework like Angular or Vue is a good choice if you're willing to trade some of that freedom of choice for stability and productivity. So uh, letting somebody else do some of those choices for you uh, and let you get off to a quicker start. It's also a good choice if you don't necessarily have a say in what your backend situation is going to be. So you're not able to choose a full stack framework, which requires you to have a specific type of backend. Then finally, a full stack framework like Vaadinflow or Fusion is a really good choice if you really value productivity and stability and maintainability uh, overall. So you essentially want to be productive from the beginning and you want to stay productive throughout the lifespan of that application. 
They are especially well suited for large projects where you have a ton of moving parts or projects that have long lifespans and you know that you're going to be maintaining it for a long period of time where really having that full stack type safety and a mechanism for ensuring that front end and back end stays in sync all the time is really, really helpful. So I tried to make a visualization of how your productivity will look like over time with these different choices, just to give you an idea of what to expect. So with the library, you have a ramp up time where you're essentially making those choices of the different parts of your framework, you're setting them up, you're configuring them to work together. Once you have all of that kind of put together, you're at peak performance, you can just churn out an application pretty quickly, have it, having a good time. But over time, that productivity starts to decline because you start running into some uh, issues. Perhaps a third party library gets updated like we looked at earlier. Also, when you're dealing with a full stack app, it might be that your backend API changes and you need to react to that. But since you don't have a kind of type safe uh, contract between these two, you might run into some trouble and kind of lose productivity tracking down issues there. With a front end framework like Vue or Angular, you'll get started a little bit quicker because again, you don't have as much to configure. And you also have slightly less things that may go wrong over the time. So more or less uh, within that framework, uh, things will stay somewhat stable. But again, you have that backend that might change underneath you and you need to take care of that over the life cycle of a long application. And finally, we have full stack frameworks, which are designed to get you up and running really quickly because most of those choices have been made for you. And also they try to minimize the amount of moving parts in the long run, especially since your front end and your back end are managed by the same framework. You have a lot kind of smaller risk of things changing in the back end that you don't notice in the front end. So if you change something in the back end because you have that full stack type safety, you'll catch those issues uh, during development time and you can fix them before you're in production and need to spend a lot of time hunting down odd bugs. Now this is a short session and you probably still have a lot of questions and a lot of digging you would like to do. So for that I've compiled a interactive comparison tool on bond.com slash comparison. You can choose any two of these frameworks and compare them side by side in code. There's also a, a sample application developed with all of these frameworks that you can check out from GitHub. Uh, to get a little bit better understanding of what a full stack application in each would look like. If you have any more uh, questions or comments, you can always reach me on Twitter at Marcus Helberg. And thanks for watching.